You know, I don't understand why my line of children's toys didn't succeed. Look at how cute they are. <laughs> okay, well maybe that one was a flop for a good reason, but every company wants their product to be the next big thing. And to do that, they will often take risks by putting their names on a product that they believe is big and innovative. But sometimes that product fails, uh, spectacularly. You'll see what I mean. Here are the 10 biggest product flops in history. Number 10 is the Ford Edsel. One of the very first great product flops ever came from the automobile originator Ford Motor Company in 1957 when they launched the Edsel, named after Henry Ford's only son. Ford was no longer the king of the road, desperately chasing Chevrolet and GM, so they announced with great fanfare over the airwaves that the Edsel is coming. The Edsel's launch was kept under more wraps than the latest iPhone release, with limited limited press and obscure pictures to create a buzz that is until September 4th, 1957 when Ford marketers declared it E-Day. And after all this buzz, the public just wasn't that into the Edsel because of the notorious mechanical issues and the market wanted smaller, better priced vehicles. In total, Ford only sold 64,000 Edsels in its first year and it was pulled from the market in 1960, becoming a case study for basically what not to do. Also, I do understand the sentiment of wanting to name this fancy car after your son, but his name was Edsel. That's like calling a car Edna. You allowed to drive the Edna, kids? It's the coolest new car! <laughs> Number 9 is the Sony Betamax. Sony learned the importance of market share the hard way when their revolutionary Betamax was blown out of the water by JVC's VHS released just a year later. In May of 1975, the proud Japanese executives revealed to the world the first home video cassette recorder in the SL6300 VCR. Now, Betamax actually created a far superior image, but VHS, with its reduced quality, had them beat with with longer playing time, where a three hour movie fit on a single tape. It also didn't help that Sony became the subject of a lawsuit filed by Disney and Universal because Betamax provided home customers the ability to record their own programming. So VHS became the ubiquitous standard home entertainment system long before DVDs and streaming, while Betamax became a niche market for enthusiasts experience a slow, painful death. But Unbelievably, it actually lasted all the way up to 2002. And for you youngins, if you've never heard of Betamax, well, my point exactly. Number eight is the Laserdisc. Laserdisc suffered a near identical fate as the Betamax, with VHS stomping all over its precious record-sized shiny surface. The Laserdisc's origins can be traced to crooner Bing Crosby, who hosted radio shows after World War II but didn't like to do them live, so he recorded low-quality shellac discs. Following the advent of higher-quality magnetic tape by Army Corps engineer Jack Mullen, the first Laserdisc called Disco Vision from Magnavox hit the market in 1978. It offered superior image and audio quality to even Betamax, but the disc's massive size, the need to flip the disc and let it load mid-movie, and high costs of the player at around $700 US, and discs around $40, keep in mind in the 1970s, made it very unattractive even to the most extreme video file. And then in the 1990s, DVDs came along and killed everything that came before it. Now we don't even have discs. Now everything's just digital. Makes you kind of wonder what's coming next. Maybe they're just gonna implant the media in our brains. They're coming for us. Number seven is New Coke. The Coca-Cola Company, the originator of cola and one of the most enduring brands in American history, had a problem in the 1980s, the Pepsi Challenge. Market research indicated that Americans preferred the sweeter Pepsi, and if steps weren't taken to correct this, by 1990, Pepsi would be the dominant soda brand. So, at the instruction of Coca-Cola CEO Roberto Goizuda, in April 23rd of 1985, they changed 
changed the recipe for the first time in 99 years and called it New Coke. And it was an immediate success. No, I'm just kidding. It was a terrible branding disaster. The New Coke failed to win over new customers and viscerally angered the Coca-Cola loyalists. So by July 11th, the very same year, Coca-Cola Classic came back to the market and New Coke was, well, killed off. You know, if Coca-Cola was trying to get new customers, maybe they should have went back to the original Coke recipe, which had cocaine in it, right? No, I'm just kidding. That's a terrible idea. Don't do drugs, kids. Number six is the Apple Newton. Apple is one of the richest companies in the world with a market cap of around 1 trillion US dollars. But before the iPhone, there was the uh, Newton. Spoiler alert, it was pretty shabby. It was, it was shabby. Steve Jobs left Apple in 1985 and his frenemy, John Scully, took the reins, eager to define himself and seized on Michael Chow's vision for a pocket-sized computer. Apple committed vast resources in the early 90s to make the Newton work with then revolutionary concepts like keyboard-free typing and a stylus that trans translates handwriting to text. And they did it! The Newton hit the market in 1993, but was way too expensive, the stylus feature barely functioned, and uh, it was just way too far ahead of its time. But the Newton's failure allowed Steve Jobs to return to the company that he founded and use some of the Newton's technology and concepts to revolutionize communication with the iPhone and iPad. Also creating digital addicts in the process. Notification? I got a tweet! <laughs> Number five was Orbit's drink. I'm not gonna lie, I used to drink this stuff in grade school and I'm pretty sure it took years off my life. Orbitz was launched in 1996 by the clearly Canadian beverage company who made something clearly different with a lava lamp soft drink with colorful edible floating balls. They marketed it as a texturally enhanced alternative beverage with wacky flavors like blueberry melon strawberry, pineapple banana cherry coconut, and Charlie Brown chocolate, expecting it to be the drink of the 90s. And boy were they wrong because Orbitz went from being a novelty beverage that basically only kids dared to drink to a total flop because flavors were comparable to um, cough syrup and pine sol. <sighs> the chewable floating balls in Orbitz that made the drink stand out as something new and different was also its greatest weakness because it was so different that it was just weird. But hey, you can still purchase vintage bottles on eBay for 40 bucks a pop. However, I would not recommend drinking it because um, yeah, you'll, you'll die. Number four is the Segway. Futurists and deep-pocketed venture capitalists predicted that the Segway would be one of the greatest inventions in history, bigger than the internet, and would revolutionize urban planning. But Segways are mostly just now a punchline, basically a way for mall cops to cruise around and effectively hassle loitering teenagers and for goofy tour groups who can't be bothered to walk. Mama, look, I know I got legs, but I'm just too lazy to use them! The Segway, which debuted on Good Morning America in December of 2001, had revolutionary stabilizing technology with promising applications in industrial industries. But as a means of transport for the average consumer, it was just way too big an ask. First off, nobody wanted to be that guy. Secondly, where and when you could drive it were opaque, but the Segway's literal death happened when the company's owner, James W. Hesselden, accidentally drove his Segway off a cliff. Listen, I've said this before, I don't care if you're a billionaire with a billion dollar idea. Natural selection comes for the stupid people. It just happens. Number three is the Microsoft Zune. Bill Gates actually used the Ford Edsel's failure as a case study in what not to do, but didn't keep that lesson in mind when Microsoft tried to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the iPod, launching the also terrible Zune in 2006. Chasing the competition is never smart, unless your product is better, more innovative, and or cheaper, which the Zune definitely wasn't. Comparing Apple's to uh, Apple, it wasn't better or worse than the iPod, 
Microsoft was just five years late to the digital player party, and by that time, the Zune HD was released in 2009, arguably better than the iPod Touch, but they were still two years late, and Microsoft only had 2% of the market. The bright spot, however, in the Zune's history, which was discontinued in 2011, was its innovative operating system, which became the backbone for Windows 8, the Windows Phone, and even the Surface Tablet, which made Microsoft competitive again. So even if you fail at something, just keep going, because it might lead to the next big thing. Doesn't that get y'all warm and fuzzy inside? <laughs> Number two is Google Glass. Google is one of the most innovative companies with their eyes on the future, but their crystal ball must have been in the shop when they launched the Google Glass in 2013. Steve Jobs once said, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. But Google never showed people something that they wanted or what problems a head-mounted computer might solve. The technology behind the device was adequate, and it certainly had a small niche of tech-savvy glass evangelists like Prince Charles, but it never really left the beta phase, so users were paying big money for an unfinished product. But the truly epic fail with Google Glass, besides looking ridiculous, were the privacy issues raised with a palpable fear of being recorded that led to bans of the device in establishments and an unflattering slur that ends with whole. I'm not gonna say it, but I'll let you figure it out. Starts with glass, ends with whole. That's all I'm saying. And number one is the Samsung Galaxy Note 7. The Samsung Galaxy Note 7 was a red hot device in 2016, but not because of sales. It was literally red hot as it exploded in customers' hands. Samsung was bullish about it challenging the iPhone Plus when they released their large screened Android phone in August of 2016 with strong reviews and brisk sales. But it all literally fizzled, popped, and burned away as stories of explosions poured in across the world with 26 US customers burned, a Southwest airline flight evacuated, and an SUV in Florida burnt to a crisp. Mama, mama, I gotta get off the phone, it's gonna explode. Okay, I love you too, no, I gotta go, bye. It was so bad that major airlines banned the device, so Samsung recalled 2.5 million devices worldwide, offering refunds or replacements, which also caught fire, so they killed the line by October of 2016. Samsung's brand image took a major hit, some estimate to be as high as 211 billion. I would make a joke and say they certainly have a future making bombs, but they literally already make tanks, so it's basically the same thing. So that was the 10 biggest product flops in history, and if you guys enjoyed this, remember to give it a big thumbs up. Also, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications by clicking the bell beside the subscribe button so that you don't miss a thing, because I release new videos all the time. Thank you guys for watching, and I'm gonna go buy a bottle of Orbitz because I'm thirsty, and I wanna be sick because it's nostalgia, okay?